In the days right after the Dayton mass shooting that killed nine and wounded 27, Governor DeWine said or did what vigil chanters demanded. He did something. He proposed tougher Ohio gun laws, mandatory background checks for private sales, and the ability to take away guns from dangerous people. But two months later, when it came time to put the proposal before lawmakers, those two provisions are missing, replaced by voluntary background checks and an expansion of the state's involuntary commitment law. Still, DeWine says his new plan meets goals he set for himself. One, it must be constitutional. It must respect both the Second Amendment and Ohioans' due process rights. Two, it must make a significant impact on the safety of all Ohioans and save lives. And three, it must be able to pass in the General Assembly. State Mayor Nan Whaley said the bill does not go far enough, but she says it's a start. This is the first time in my career that I have witnessed our state government seriously consider restrictions on access to guns instead of allowing more dangerous weapons in our communities. Laura Bischoff, in the end, was it lawmakers and their reluctance to do anything tougher on guns that caused DeWine to change his plan? Well, let's face it, the, the Ohio General Assembly is uh, in, in the firm control of Republicans who are very adamantly in favor of the Second Amendment, and they see any kind of erosion or restrictions as, in, as unconstitutional, um, not the right step. You know, remember, um, Ohio House Speaker Larry Householder campaigned on a platform of Second Amendment rights. He appeared in a campaign commercial in, in, in full camo, carrying a shotgun, and he, and he blasted apart a TV. Jackie, is this plan stronger than his original plan? No. No. I mean, it's stronger in the sense that he feels as though it can pass and that it, it will withstand any sort of constitutional challenge. Um, it's, it's gotten kind of a lukewarm response in the House, uh, where um, you know, Speaker Householder said earlier this week that he has concerns about um, especially the, the background check, it's an optional check, uh, but he feels that the way that it's, it's worded, it actually does make it mandatory. So it, it's interesting to see that what um, you know, most of the, the press and observers saw as a watered down version is still meeting, uh, you know, quite a bit of resistance. I, I said from the beginning, I admired his courage in putting this legislation forward, but I didn't think it would go. It's 17 points. He's tried. Now, if, I, if, if my recollection is correct, there's still six bills in the Senate, four in the House, or seven in the Senate and four in the House. And then moving forward. But I always said I didn't know the composition of legislation that would be able to pass, point number one. Point number two, I, I didn't see the coalition that he could build in order to get any meaningful legislation through. And quietly in the background, uh, NRA has been there all the time. So I, I, I applaud him, but I didn't think anything was going to happen. Was he just not expending enough political capital Terry, publicly anyway, and could he have pushed through maybe the background checks at least? Maybe not the red flag law, but the background checks? Well, I think some aspects are good progress, like the pink slip law and the way they would do that through a probate court in order to separate a person with major problems from their guns, and that's some good progress, and I can see elements where that could pass. This is the law where if someone has severe mental illness, and now this would expand it to drug and alcohol abuse, you could commit them and then by that by that action take them away from their guns. And in this version of the governor's plan, it would go through the probate court, which is used to dealing with these kind of cases of people who have Terry, these issues and problems. To, you'd have to manifest too much evidence in order to convince a, a probate judge to take a person's gun away from them. Well, but the police first have the right, under the pink slip law that exists today, of taking somebody out of the environment they're in, whether it's spousal abuse or it's something related to guns, for up to three days. So it expands on that law, adds some additional definitions. And then the other part of it that I can see a way where the governor, right now there's a lot of blowback on the liability risk if somebody sells a gun to somebody who doesn't already have pre-check, and there might be some ways legislatively to fine-tune that. So the details are important because this is a state of 11.7 billion people. You've got to make sure the law will work practically. But I think it gives some more tools. It isn't done yet, but I can see some progress. 
You know, what's interesting about this is that the national groups like Giffords Law Center, the Brady Center, Every Town, Moms Demand Action, and the Ohio Gun Owners Association agree they don't like DeWine's proposal. The, the gun control people th say it doesn't go far enough, and the Ohio uh, Gun Owners, which is probably the furthest right yep. group out of, out of the gun groups in Ohio, says that it, it goes too far. And I think that, um, I think that it's probably going to get picked apart uh, slow walked, attacked. Um, there will be all kinds of efforts trying to try and stop it, um, and because it doesn't have the the backing of the gun groups that you know saying like, okay, this is this is good. Uh, I don't I don't know that it's going to survive, or I don't think it'll pass in a really quick manner. Out there, Jackie, is this ballot initiative trying to get mandatory universal background checks on the ballot in 2020. They're still collecting signatures. They say this does not go far enough, and we're going to go all out to get it on the ballot. So voters could decide this. Right. Uh, yeah. They left that option open. Uh, you know, they're out collecting signatures. I think it's it's probably a smart move. Um, you know, what they're proposing is backed up by a lot of polling showing that it has broad support, uh, you know, 90 percent. And, you know, something that has 90 percent support across parties, across age groups and demographics is something that's really, really rare. And, you know, they've always said that this is, you know, it's got to go to the legislature first. And we, we hope that the legislature acts. We hope that they, you know, enact our proposal or you know, something very close to it. Uh, but they are prepared to go to the voters if they need to. And I think that petition threat is potentially a lever that the governor can push and use as a reason why to adopt something uh, and a comp craft some sort of a compromise. And the other thing is, remember the date of December 17th, that's the filing deadline for people that want to run for the legislature. And once we get past that and people know they do or don't have a primary, that might also make it easier in early 2020 to get something done. 